Hi, I'm Chitana and I'm here in Seattle's Japantown, also known as Nihonmachi. This neighborhood used to span from 4th Avenue all the way to 23rd Avenue. It went across Jackson Street, Main Street, Washington Street, and Yesler Ave up the hill. It was full of people, restaurants, storefronts. Uh, it had a ton of homes here as well. It's needless to say, this was a really, really large part of Seattle. Unfortunately though, it was a neighborhood and community forever changed after World War II and Executive Order 9066. Um, if you're being really generous, some people would say that Japantown in Seattle today is only about six blocks big. Um, but we still want to remember the neighborhood that was here. We still want to remember the neighborhood and community that is here today. And so that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna show you some spots around the block. So I'm standing here at what used to be the old Main Street School, this building. It was built in 1906 and a lot of the students were living in and around this neighborhood. Um, they were mostly children of Asian immigrants. Eventually, in the 1920s, Bailey Gadsert up the street was built and all the kids would then just walk up there. But the main teacher for this school and then eventually Bailey Gadsert was Miss Ada Mahone. Um, Miss Mahone loved all of her students. She respected their cultures, but she also loved to remind them that they were American since they were here. Um, the day after Pearl Harbor happened, she came into her classroom and she saw that a lot of her students, which were Japanese American, were afraid. And she told them, you guys were Americans yesterday, you guys are Americans today. You guys were friends yesterday, you guys are friends today. And she tried her best to comfort them. But when the day came that her Japanese American students and their parents were leaving Seattle, walking away with with what they were able to carry. A lot of people remember saying goodbye to her. She sat on the steps of the school all day, just waving and crying. Um, she was devastated to see what happened to her students and the community here. But today, this building's no longer school. It is now a dentist office. So I'm here in Seattle's Kobe Terrace Park. It's named after Kobe, which is Seattle's sister city over in Japan. And the terrace part comes from the fact that we're on the terraced hillside of the neighborhood. So, um, pretty tiring walking up here. You have to walk up the hill. You could also walk down as well. But every springtime, it's definitely worth it to check this place out. Um, there are a ton of these beautiful Mount Fuji cherry blossom trees that line a lot of the pathways here. So when you're walking up or down, you just have these beautiful bright pink and white flowers above you, on the ground, just everywhere. And these trees were actually a gift to Seattle um, as a birthday present. So in the early years of the Maneki restaurant down the street, there was this young dishwasher that worked here for a bit uh, from Japan, and his name was Takeo Miki. Takeo eventually went down to California to go to college down there and then once he graduated he returned to Japan. But he still really loved the U.S. for taking him in um, when he was a young man. Eventually Takeo Miki became the Prime Minister of Japan in the 1970s and in 1976 when America turned 200 years old he gifted Seattle 1,000 cherry blossom trees to be planted all around the city. Even though America and Japan um, had a very rocky relationship throughout the 20th century and especially during the 1940s, Takeo still really loved and appreciated both places and hoped that we could still have this beautiful friendship between the two. Um, so come every springtime, it's really great to walk around here, see the flowers, and just be reminded of that beautiful, beautiful friendship and solidarity. So the frog behind me was the logo for the Higo Variety Store, um, the store that the Murakamis owned. And they decided to choose a picture of a frog as their logo, all things, 
um, because they couldn't really decide on one image to choose for their logo. Since they were a variety store, they sold all types of things. They sold household items, they sold sandals, they sold toys, they just sold a bunch of different things. So they settled on a picture of a frog because it was a pun. It was funny. It was kind of like a joke. In Japanese, um, the word for frog is kairu. Right? And then the term to return or to come back is kairimasu. Some people also just say kairu for short. So those words are the same, frog and return. The family wanted customers to return. They wanted people and money to come back to their store. So they decided to choose the frog. So I'm here in Chio's garden. This garden and the Jackson building, which is in front of this garden, was constructed in 1932 by Sanzo and his wife, Matsuyo Murakami. They owned a store, a business called the Higo Variety Store. Um, it opened early on in the early 1900s, but they eventually expanded to a much larger store on Jackson Street. They wanted to make sure to have this green space, this place to play, because they had four children. Um, hi to me, right here. And this garden is named after Chio Murakami. She was the middle daughter. Chio was born in 1915 and she passed away in 1937 when she was only 22 years old from tuberculosis. Back then, uh, tuberculosis was known as the big killer and it took a lot of lives here in Seattle. But for the past year, in the past year of Chio's life, she kept a diary and just wrote about her days. And uh, it's published in the book Meet Me at Higo. And when you read it, um, it is pretty, I don't know, unordinary. Chio wrote about playing with her dog Skippy and chasing him around this space. She wrote about working at her parents' store. She wrote about what she ate. She wrote about the weather. But when you read it, you could just tell that she was this regular American girl. She loved her family, she loved her dog, um, she loved this neighborhood that she was a part of. And remember, she passed away in 1937. So she never saw what had happened to her neighborhood, her community, and her family just a few years later in World War II. So this garden is dedicated to her, not only her, but um, the spirit of children and innocence in Japantown. When a lot of people talk about Seattle's Japantown today, um, it could be pretty sad. There's a lot to be said about things that are lost, things that were taken. And while those things were are really important to talk about, um, it's important to remember that this was once a really vibrant, happy place for a lot of people. Too. There were a lot of kids, a lot of people just like Chio Murakami who loved this neighborhood and the community in it, who knew this space like the back of their hand and who just felt safe and welcomed here. Here at the Panama Hotel. This building was built in 1910 and like a lot of the other buildings that were here um, surrounding it, it was a regular hotel. It had hotel rooms in the upstairs that housed immigrants and labor workers. Um, it had commercial spaces on the ground floor and in the basement there was actually a Japanese bathhouse or uh, sento. But today, this building is anything but average. It's actually considered a national landmark. And to understand its importance, we have to go back to 1942. After Executive Order 9066 was enacted, um, Japanese Americans and their parents were forced to leave their homes, bringing only what they were able to carry. So imagine trying to pack your whole life away in just one suitcase, especially when you didn't know where you were going or how long you were going to be gone for. Um, imagine the things that you would pack. So people had to bring, um, they had to pack smartly 
and instead of getting rid of most of their items or selling them, a lot of people wanted to hold on to these things that were so special to them. So some people were lucky enough to have friends that were not Japanese who kept their items for them, but the owner of this building had a really um, you know, big basement but with the bathhouse and all. So he allowed families to store their items in there. So about 40 families took him up on his offer. Um, they went to the camps and three years later, Japanese Americans were released. But a lot of people who lived in Seattle chose not to return. Um, some people were scared, some people were not interested, a lot of people financially couldn't. So a lot of those things were just sitting there. They sat collecting dust for decades. Around the 1980s, after the building sat idle for a bit, um, a new owner, a lady named Jan Johnson, bought it and she, in a way, renovated it, revitalized it. She reopened the hotel rooms upstairs. She opened a coffee house and tea house on the ground floor and she brought to light those things that were sitting in the basement for so long. And that was a really special moment for Seattle because at that point this neighborhood had been changed dramatically. Most of the businesses that were owned by Japanese Americans had closed down. Most of the buildings that were here before World War II were gone and there wasn't really a Japanese American presence here, at least not a large one like there was before. A lot of people in Seattle didn't even know that there was a Japan town. Um, but when those items were found, it was a reminder, a reminder to our city, a reminder that there was once a large community here. There were people, there were stores, there were businesses that were really taken from Seattle so abruptly. And it was a reminder of what we did.